Today, I want to invite us to think about changing perspectives, changing perspectives. So one of the things that I have learned this week as I have been studying these Bible passages is that as hopefully most of you know, the Old Testament was originally written in uh, biblical Hebrew and that we use multiple different English translations. And when translators translate, they make choices. So in the version that we normally read in worship in the ELCA, the NRSV, the New Revised Standard Version, it says that the snakes that were in the wilderness were poisonous snakes. What it says in Hebrew is that they were seraph snakes which means that they were flying snakes. So imagine these poor Israelites are out in the desert. They've been taken away from everything they knew. They were slaves, but they knew how to be slaves. They knew how to live under oppression and they didn't really know how to live in the desert. And they're out in the desert and they're angry and upset because they feel like their whole entire lives have been completely disrupted. And so I don't know if God sent the flying snakes. Um, remember the Bible are stories that people tell about their relationships to each other and God. Uh, but I do know that there were flying snakes there in the story and that Moses aligned with the people against the problem and prayed to God and God provided Moses with a solution. I don't know if you know, but our modern day medical symbol of a snake wrapped around a T uh, comes from this Bible story where people could look at the bronze serpent on the pole and be healed. They had to change their perspective. However, the flying snakes got there and however they bit people and made them sick and made them die, maybe because of chaos in the world and people often blame God for chaos in the world. Um, the point is that God and Moses together helped them find a solution, helped them find a solution. One of the things that I've been learning a lot about lately is that when there are conflicts between people, particularly parents and children, one of the best things to do is to make it parent and child against the problem, as opposed to parent against child. So for example, if a child doesn't want to get dressed for school in the morning, instead of having a power battle of, I'm telling you to get dressed and you are refusing to get dressed and making it parent against child, you can make it parent and child together against the problem. For example, okay, so you're having a hard time getting dressed today. What is it that you need? Um, what is it that we could try tomorrow together to make it possible for you to get dressed for school? Um, I know that in my house, uh, usually it has to do with having to cut a scratchy tag out of a shirt or a piece of clothing um, or finding a different uh, fabric uh, are normally the things that happen in my house around that situation. And so in our Bible story, we see that it is Moses and God and the people against the problem of the flying snakes that are killing people and causing them to die. When people come together to solve problems instead of yelling at one another or being in conflict with one another, we can be truly open to hearing the voice of God in our lives. Where we align ourselves matters. And so in our second lesson for today, the writer of Ephesians tells us that we are saved by grace so that we do not have to rely on our own works. This is great news because it means that we don't have to be perfect. 
It means that we do not have to do all the exact right things or believe all of the right things. It means that we do not have to rely on ourselves. We don't have to rely on each other because faith comes by grace. And yes, absolutely, we respond to that grace. Absolutely, we share that grace in others. Absolutely, we love God back by loving other people as we love ourselves. And the response to the grace is important piece of being a disciple of Jesus. But having the grace, having the grace to know that we get to mess up and we get to do works wrong, but we're saved by grace, we're saved by the love of God. We're saved by the person of Jesus who goes to death on the cross for us and then comes back to life. That is absolutely everything. That is us getting together to solve problems. That is us getting together to hear the word of God. It can be so hard to be open to the word of God in our lives. It can be so hard to be open to the work of God in our lives. Sometimes perfection or having to do something perfectly is the enemy of trying things. Sometimes it's the enemy of um, doing something well. When we get really worried about having to be perfect, perfect in our behavior, perfect in our appearance, perfect in our beliefs, instead of focusing on the relationships and how are we together, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> how are we together going to be disciples? It keeps us from hearing God's voice. It keeps us from knowing what it is God is inviting us to do in response to the free gift of grace. For example, I once met a woman who told me that she was unable to come to church on Sunday. She called me on Saturday night um, to let me know that she had no clean nylons or pantyhose uh, without runs in them. And she could not possibly show up to church um, without clean nylons, without runs in them. I have met people who have said, oh, I'm having a bad hair day. I can't go out in public. I know many people, and this has happened in my own family, where people are unwilling or unable to go to church after someone that they love has died because they can't handle potentially breaking down and crying. I know that sometimes I still cry at the hymns in church that were sung at my dad's funeral. And I know that especially in the first year after a death, many spouses in particular find it really hard to go to church because they might cry when they are there. But in Christian community, we were together. In Christian community, we hold one another while we cry. After all, it is God who put tear ducts in our body. If God didn't want us to cry, God wouldn't have made us with tear ducts. In Christian community, we can hold each other and grieve with each other. We can find the person who is hurting, drag them in front of the pole with the bronze serpent and point to it and say, look here, this is how things will get better. We don't have a pole with a bronze serpent in our church, but we do certainly have the cross. We do certainly have a symbol of hope. We certainly have something that gives us grace upon grace and gives us eternal life, which is amazing because it means we're free to try. We're free to try things. We're free to try things like fundraisers so that we can get outdoor worship set up. We're free to try different methods of communication. We are free to try things like Zoom worship. We mm -hmm. are free to try things and they might not work. And that's okay if they don't work because ultimately it's not about us. Ultimately, it's about our relationship with God and our relationship with one another. God so loved the world that he sent Jesus, his son, to die for us 
so that we always have the promise of eternal life. And when you have the promise of eternal life way deep down inside of yourself, when you have the promise of eternal life and forgiveness of sin and the unconditional love of Jesus as a community, it becomes perfectly safe to shift your perspective, to let go of everything having to be perfect and to lean into those relationships with each other, to lean into grace with each other, to work together to help one another feel and experience and know and think about and process God's grace and then to all get together to discern what it will be going forward. If you were Moses and people were complaining about ministry and you were to pray to God and say, dear God, what can I do? How can we and the people complaining be aligned together against whatever the problem is so that we can truly hear your voice and be open to you and fully experience your healing? What do you think God would say to you? What do you think God would invite you to do? Now, I am a thousand percent sure God is not inviting you to make a bronze sculpture and stick it on a pole anywhere near church. To be clear, God will not invite you into uh, using an idol in that particular way. But I don't know what God might be inviting us into. I do know that because we have been saved by grace, if we make a mistake, we get to say, oh, I'm sorry. Because we have been saved by grace, we can try something. And if that thing doesn't work, we can simply try a different thing. Because it's not our works that save us. It's not having a super high production value because we have paid for uh, professional audiovisual people to do our worship presentations on Sunday. It's about us knowing deep down and us feeling and understanding that we have been saved by grace that is wider and bigger and more all-encompassing than we can possibly imagine. And it's about our invitation to share that grace with one another and to share that grace with the world around us. It's good, good news that we don't have to be perfect in order to be disciples. We don't have to be perfect to be in relationship with one another. We don't have to be perfect to present the gospel to others. As Miss Anne pointed out, you don't even have to be able to tell your own story a whole bunch. You can just simply recite the Bible verse. That is the gospel in miniature. You can say, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. There's a miniature gospel right there that you are invited to share with others. Not because you're perfect, not because you're the most spiritual or the one most connected to God, but because you know what it's like to be saved. You know what it's like to not have to be perfect all the time. You know what it's like to lean into a Jesus who offers us together, a change in perspective, so that it's not about us. It's about how we all work together to point each other and the world around us to the Jesus who loves us unconditionally, beyond imagining. May you be blessed today to be open to the ways God might shift your perspective. May you be open today to letting go of the need to do things perfectly and to experience the freedom to try. May you be open today to, like Moses, go to God and ask what's going on and what we can do about it and let others know. May you be blessed today to know without a doubt that no matter how you are, if you have perfect hair, or if you're gonna cry in worship today, or if we haven't done things perfectly, that Jesus still died for us. Jesus still was resurrected for us. Jesus still promises us unconditional love, forgiveness of sin, and eternal life. 
May you be a blessed to have all that you need to hold on to that truth. Thanks be to God. Amen.